Hey everyone, Eric here with EPB Macro Research. In this video, we're going to be talking about quantitative easing, or QE. Specifically, we're going to touch on how it works, does it actually boost the money supply, and most importantly, is it inflationary? We're going to start by trying to follow the paper trail from a very high level, sort of a flow chart style, and then we'll look at the T account and, and the accounting of, of QE. To start, the Treasury sells debt to the public, not directly to the Federal Reserve. And in return, the Treasury gets cash, which they then spend into the real economy. The biggest expenditures of the government being Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, defense, things like that. Now, when the Fed engages in QE, they buy the debt from the public, usually the banks or primary dealers more specifically, or from other non-bank financial institutions like hedge funds, pension funds, life insurance companies, using the primary dealers as an intermediary. We're going to go through each example separately because they're different. Now, if the Fed buys treasuries from the bank, the transaction is nothing more than an asset swap. The bank gives the Fed a treasury, but the Fed does not give the bank cash. The Fed credits the bank's reserve account held at the Fed, so the reserve account goes up. Now, these reserves don't fit the definition of money because they're not a medium of exchange. You cannot pay your employees with reserves. You can't go to the store and buy a sandwich with reserves. Th these reserves can be used, however, to satisfy various regulatory and reserve requirements, in essence, freeing up space for the banks to make more loans into the real economy. In order for a loan to happen, banks still have to come to an agreement with customers to make a new loan, and there's been reluctance on both sides, both from the banks and the consumers, in, uh, to engage in a new loan because the economy is very weak and consumers are very over-indebted, which is why there's never been a significant increase in loans despite a higher uh, amount of excess reserves in the system, and then there's been no inflation. The money that's created or the reserves that are created gets stuck in the financial system and never make their way into the real economy. So no loans means no money is being created into the real economy. Now let's say the Fed wants to buy $100 billion a month of treasuries, but the banks only have $50 billion. The banks would still be intermediaries, but they would need to buy bonds from other institutions and then flip those to the Fed and get reserves. The bank, however, would credit the non-bank with actual cash. So the non-bank gives the bank a treasury, the bank gives the treasury to the Fed, the reserve account goes up, and new cash is created at the non-bank. In this particular case, the money supply would go up because the non-bank has newfound cash. They exchanged their treasury for newly created cash from the banking system. It's not inflationary, however, because the non-bank, could be a hedge fund, pension fund, life insurance company, does not have many avenues to get that money back into the real economy. Typically what they'll do is they'll recycle that money back into financial markets. They had a treasury security, now they have cash. That cash is probably going to make its way into a financial asset, either a safe one or a risk asset. This can certainly increase uh, speculation in financial markets and increase the price of assets, but no money in this scenario is getting into the real economy. The only way money gets into the real economy is when the treasury spends money directly into the economy or banks make new loans. You can see here how QE creates a, a boom-bust type system because money continues to circulate in the financial markets and asset prices can go up. But if there's no loans being made, then the real economy starts to, to atrophy. Financial markets get bigger, the real economy gets smaller, and you have less cash flows in the real economy to support increased valuations in financial assets. So that's generally how uh, QE works. When there's only two parties, when it's only the banks and the Federal Reserve, it's merely an asset swap and there's not much impact. The net effect really is just reducing interest income in the private sector because the Fed is taking a five to seven year bond on average out of circulation and giving back an overnight deposit with a lower interest rate. So there's really not much going on when it's a two party transaction, banks and the Federal Reserve. When a non-bank is, is involved, Cash is created, but that cash generally stays in the financial world and never leaks into the real economy. This is exactly the reason why we've had QE for so many years. There's been trillions of dollars of quote-unquote money printing, even though through this example we understand that most of it is just reserve printing. And there's been no consumer inflation as a result, just more uh, asset uh, inflation or asset speculation. So 
Now let's go through the, the T account so we can see it from a different angle. Let's say, let's take the first example with the Fed buying uh, $10 of bonds from the banks or primary dealers. So we have the, uh, we have $200 of assets at the Fed and $200 of liabilities at the Fed. We have $200 of assets at the banks and $200 of liabilities at the banks. Now this is before the transaction. The transaction is going to be the Fed is going to buy $10 of bonds from the bank. So the bank has $50 of bonds. What's going to happen after is the bank now has $40 of bonds because the Fed took 10 and their assets go up by 10 in the reserve line item. So there's no actual net change in assets at the bank. At the Fed, the amount of bonds went up, so assets go up by 10, and the amount of reserves that they credited the banks, which is a liability at the Fed, go up by 10. So in this example, there's no change in assets at the banks and $10 of increase at the Federal Reserve. This example is merely an asset swap. Banks had $50 of bonds and $100 of reserves. Now they have $40 of bonds and $110 of reserves, still have $200 total of assets. Now if we go to example two, where the Fed buys $10 of bonds from a non-bank, what we have is $200 of assets and liabilities at the Fed, $200 of assets and liabilities at the bank, and $100 of assets at a non-bank. Just forget the liabilities. So when the transaction clears, when the Fed wants to buy $10 of bonds, but in this case they're going to buy them from the non-bank, what happens after the transaction is the securities go from $100 to $90 because the security was a treasury. The bank has $50 of bonds. They still have $50 of bonds. It's the reserve account that goes up. So what happens here when the Fed buys bonds from a non-bank is the Federal Reserve assets go up by 10, the bank assets go up by 10, and the non-bank assets stay the same, but new money is created. There's a new deposit, $10 a deposit. That's real cash. That cash can be used anywhere, unlike reserves, which cannot circulate freely. That new deposit, which was a treasury, which is now a deposit, can go anywhere. Traditionally, that goes back into financial markets, not into the real economy, which is why QE is completely ineffective in generating inflation on the consumer level, but it can increase speculation in financial markets as long as the underlying economy has the cash flows to support the elevated asset prices. As soon as the economy starts to atrophy and the cash flows start to dry up and there starts to be defaults, asset price valuations start to come down irrespective of QE or no QE. So going back to our example here, there's only two ways for, for money to get into the real economy. Loans, or, or the treasury, spending money, and then money that's already in the real economy that continues to circulate. The cash that's created from, from QE is when the Fed purchases a bond from a non-bank, but that new cash typically gets stuck in financial markets and never makes its way into the real economy. Loans and the treasury is most of the way that the money gets into the new money gets into the real economy. So the easy question is if banks are unwilling to extend new loans or consumers are unwilling to, to increase uh, leverage or increase more debt, why can't the Treasury just spend a ton of money into the real economy? Won't that create inflation? That's going to be the topic of the next video. This is not such a simple concept. There's laws of diminishing marginal returns. The uh, Treasury has to increase debt in order to spend money into the real economy or increase taxes. Most uh, of the examples today uh, cite increasing uh, federal deficits and spending money into the real economy in order to generate inflation. That's going to be the entire topic of the next video. That's generally how QE works. Um, it, so QE can boost the money supply. Uh, depends how the transaction goes down. It, it does not generate consumer inflation because none of the money actually makes its way into the real economy. In order for new money to go into the real economy, we'll need to see an increase in bank lending or an increase in uh, fiscal spending. Uh, it's questionable whether fiscal spending can generate inflation for, for reasons we'll discuss in the next episode. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and click subscribe down below. I'll be coming out with more of these videos on different concepts. Uh, if you thought it was helpful, please share this video with others, help build the channel. Uh, I also run a premium service hosted through Seeking Alpha, which ties the economic cycle research into a long-term portfolio strategy. If you'd like to uh, check that out, the link to that service with a two-week free trial will be in the description box below. Uh, I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you in the next video.